songs. I absolutely love that song. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn way back to the Old Testament book of Genesis. And the 22nd chapter, Genesis chapter 22. I don't know about you, but I'll never forget the day I got my driver's license. It was a big day in my life. I took uh, months of the uh, course at the uh, public school, and then you had to take your six hours behind the wheel. Well, they did it alphabetically, and I figured someplace about the end of August I would finally get my license that summer. So I found a way. I called around, found a little town, and took all my six hours at one time. And then I knew I would still be nearly the end of my class trying to get my license. And so I called around some more and, and got in in Monoman, of all places, to take my test and was actually the first guy to get my license out of our class that summer. And I, I remember afterwards they, they said, now pose for the picture on your license and you're supposed to look kind of sober. But I couldn't help but smile. And I had this big cheesy grin on my face because I had passed the test. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about tonight, passing the test. Here in Genesis chapter 22, the Bible says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he, that is God, said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee unto the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Now, we'll take a look at this story in a little bit more depth, but for now, let's talk about passing the test, but let's pray first, shall we? Father, we thank you now for the privilege to own a Bible and possess it and to see something that took place so long ago, to look into so many verses and to draw from it a 21st century truth that will help us in this day and age in which we're living. We pray now that you would use your word tonight to speak to our hearts and that you'd receive glory and honor out of it. And we pray now all these things in Jesus' name, amen. You know, the uh, man Frank Lloyd Wright is known as an architectural genius. And if you studied architecture at all, you've seen some of the masterpieces that he created. Well, Frank Lloyd Wright was hired to uh, design the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. And Tokyo was a city known for earthquakes and, and tremors. And so he was quite concerned how he could build this, this uh, skyscraper, in a sense, and, and dig down far enough to get good footings. And, so he began to dig in the place where they had bought to erect the thing and found that he only had to go down six feet until he hit a bed of mud. And then it was nothing but mud for the next 60 feet. He had an idea that maybe if he just laid the foundation on that bed of mud that went down for the next 60 feet, that during an earthquake, maybe it would kind of serve to be a, a shock absorber and, and it would absorb the, the tremors and it would be kind of like a, a floating structure. And everybody mocked him for his idea, but he, he went ahead and built that Imperial Hotel nonetheless on basically a 60 foot bed of mud. Well, it didn't take long for the test to come because just within four years, Tokyo had the worst tremors and earthquake that it had had in over 50 years. And all the buildings around the Imperial Hotel felt like matchsticks except the Imperial Hotel. And Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright was right. He, he actually passed the test with his experiment and his motel or hotel stood the test. In Genesis chapter 22, we find a great man by the name of Abraham. Abraham, we could say technically, would have been the first Jew, and the Jewish race that was still with us yet to this day was started way back yonder 4,000 years ago by this great patriarch, this brightest star in the Hebrew heaven that we know to be as Abraham. And he was really elevated quickly because of his faith. And you even get over to the New Testament, and when it talks about faith and points to somebody that exhibited faith that uses Abraham of all people. He was a man of faith. And here we find in Genesis chapter 22, he's called really to a great test of faith. He was called by God to take his son Isaac, his beloved son Isaac, on a three-day journey to this place called Mount Moriah. At that time, there was nothing there. Today, that city of Jerusalem is there. He would have probably taken Abraham to the highest point of Mount Moriah. Today, the Temple Mount is on the highest point of Mount Moriah. It's quite probable that the ancient temple was really built on the very site where Abraham attempted to sacrifice his son Isaac. And Isaac, in so many ways, is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and his submission and the only begotten son of his father and all along those lines. 
And we find here that God calls Abraham to a great test. In verse 1, it said, It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. You say, Pastor, does God actually tempt us? And isn't there a verse somewhere in the Bible that says that God doesn't tempt us? Why, yes, there is. But it's in the New Testament. In James 1.13, the Bible says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. You say, is that a contradiction? No, not at all. The bottom line is God does not tempt us in the sense of putting sin in front of us like a carrot and dangling it before us and luring us into temptation. The word tempt means test. The word tempt means try. We get our word trial from it. And God will allow us to go through trials or testings or in that sense, temptation but let no man say when he's tempted he's tempted of God he's tempted of his own lust in fact and he's he's drawn away but when it comes to God and testing yes he will test us you know the Lord's Prayer as it's been called by the world has these words in it lead us not into temptation you've heard that before you've read that before you say well what's that all about well it's basically a prayer to God to please bypass the trials for us or bypass the testings for us but the truth of the matter is beloved those testings are good for us, and God brings them into our lives. He allows them in our lives in order to temper us in so many different ways. There's times I've pictured God, if you will, as a goalie, a, an NHL goalie in the sense that nothing's going to get into the net, but it gets by him. And, and folks, there's nothing going to get into our lives unless God allows it, unless God lets it by him. And there are going to be times in our lives that God does allow testings and God does allow trials. In Exodus 20 and in verse 20, the Bible says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you. That kind of a test, that kind of a temptation, that kind of a trial, when God comes to prove you. And there out there in the wilderness, God came to prove the people of God. You know, there's a song that we sing, I Must Tell Jesus. And in that song, we have these words, Tested and tried, I need a great savior and folks we are all tested we're all tried and we all need a great savior we know how the outcome was for Abraham here when he raised the dagger over the breast of his son Isaac God called out and he said no now I know you fear me you don't have to go through with it and Abraham passed the test and so let's take a few moments here this evening to talk about passing the test and let's talk about first of all the routine of it the routine of passing the test. What is the, the way that this works? What is the method that this works? Well, turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter 13, and we'll actually hone in on Abraham at that time, or Moses at that time, when he was leading the children of Israel through the wilderness, and they had come out of Egypt with a mighty hand and a high hand after God had decimated the country with 10 plagues. And, and instead of making a beeline, for the Holy Land, for Palestine, God does a funny thing with them. He kind of does an about face and he takes them in a different direction. In Exodus 13 and in verse number 18, it says, but God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. You say, what's he up to here? He takes them kind of a different way. He takes them to the south. He takes them over more toward Arabia. And he takes them over by this passage, this particular passage of the Red Sea. And I wish I had more time to go into why. But look in verse 21. The Bible says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and by night. And he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So now he's out front. He's leading them by day and by night. And you get into chapter 14. And in verse number five, the Bible says, and it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? that we have let Israel go from serving us. And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. 
And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with an high hand, but the Egyptians pursued after them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them in camping by the sea beside Piharaoth before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians who ye have seen today, ye shall see them again, no more forever." We find here that Moses knew it was going to happen. And the psalmist tells us in the Psalms why. God had a way of showing his, his acts to the people of Israel. They saw it when it actually unfolded. They actually saw it when it happened. But the Bible says he showed his ways unto Moses. He showed to Moses beforehand what he was going to do. And we find out here that they, they have this great test. And God has a reason for this test. What is the routine of testing and passing the test. Well, let me just say first of all that sometimes testings from God are to permit us to suffer. Now that sounds cruel, but it, it isn't. Because whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Whom the Lord loveth, he puts through the mill. He takes to the woodshed. He allows to suffer in some ways. The Bible tells us of Paul and Silas in Acts 16 and in verse 23 that when they, the jailer, had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Now, here's Paul and Silas, and being God's choice servants, you'd think God could do better than that. I mean, allowing them to be whipped and their feet placed in these hard iron st uh, stocks here and, and to go through this suffering. But God had a reason for this. And God will put us through things at time to temper us. And it's the suffering that will temper us. It's, it's the suffering that will help us to get a word from him and to find light from him and to be able to trust him more. You know, I've been to the Tower of London and in the city of London right by the Thames. And, and uh, the Tower of London is a very scary place. Now, it's not today, but I mean, it was an awful place 500 years ago and even before that. And many centuries ago, there was a a, a Christian, a, a preacher by the name of Fisher, who was brought into the Tower of London to be beheaded. And as he was uh, taken uh, underneath the scaffold to be uh, put in his, his, his holding cell, knowing that a few days from there he would be up on that scaffold where he would be beheaded before the people, he cried out and he said, Oh Lord, he said, I, I need something from you to give me some courage at this time to die. And he went back and he found his Greek New Testament and he looked at it in his cell there. And it opened naturally to John 16, 23. says, and in that day, Christ is speaking, you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whether, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he shall give it you. And he said, uh, Father, I got a message from you. I know you'll be with me up on that scaffolding. And I know you'll go through this trial with me. And praise God, I'm ready for eternity. You know, God will allow testings in our lives, number one, to permit us to suffer. Number two, the routine of, of, of trials and testings and temptations often involve delays. God teaches us to wait through our temptations. And I know this. To me, the word wait is a four-letter word. I hate that word, and I hate to wait. And I don't know about you, but there's something about waiting that makes the testing even worse. But God will use that testing and he will uh, couple it with waiting to try and teach us patience. You know, when Jesus was called to heal Lazarus, the Bible tells us he stayed two days further where he was. And then finally he went on his way. And when he got there, Lazarus was dead. And in John 11 and in verse 21, then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. We find here it involved a delay like like testing and, and temptations do but something good came out of it and and the Lord used it in a great way and he said this is not unto death but for the glory of God and folks our testings and especially the delay that goes with them 
is for God's glory. Turn, if you would, to Psalm chapter 13. I don't know if you've noticed it, but testings and trials in my life normally are heightened and made worse, if you will, by that delay, by that having to wait, because testings normally involve delays. Have you gone through a testing as of late and you just wish it would be over? Well, notice in Psalm 13 and in verse number one, here's David. He says, how long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? <laughs> Ever felt that way? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? Lord, how long is this going to go on? Forever? Feels like it. Testings normally involve delays. Look in Psalm 69, if you would. They involve the uh, word W-A-I-T. Wait. We have to wait. God's not on our time frame. God's not on our schedule. God's way is perfect, and his timing is always perfect. He knows what he's doing. In Psalm 69 and in verse number 3, here we find David again, and he says, I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. Are you waiting on something right now? Something that God is delaying in your life? You know, we see the routine of, of waiting or of, of testings, and it normally involves suffering. It normally involves waiting. Thirdly, it normally involves, or quite often at least involves, unorthodox plans, strange plans, a, a really different approach than we would think. Have you noticed, as Isaiah said in chapter 59 that, or 55, that God's ways are not our ways? As high as the heaven is above the earth, so are God's ways above our ways. And when God tests us, it's normally in a different way than we would anticipate. You know, I think of when Moses took the children of Israel up to the eastern edge of the Jordan, and he signed off there on Mount Moab there, and, and uh, Joshua took over, took the baton, and it was now his job to get the children of Israel across the Jordan and to take on the very first city, Jericho. And so they get across the river, and he's eyeing up Jericho, a, a, a mound today that I've been to, the ruins of Jericho. And as he's looking at that impregnable city, he's, he's kind of figuring maybe we can use catapults and battering rams and, 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 and ladders and whatever else. And all of a sudden, somebody shows up there in the shadows, and and Joshua goes over to him with sword drawn, and he says, are you with us or against us? And the voice of the man there says, I'm the captain of the Lord's host. I didn't come to take sides. I came to take over. And Joshua hits the dirt, and he realizes it's an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, Joshua, I've got a battle plan for you. It's a little unorthodox. It's a little off the wall. I'm going to have to think out of the box a little bit here, but... I want you and the army of Israel for the next six days to march around this city of Jericho one time every day for six days. Keep your mouth shut. Just kind of do what I tell you. Now, on the seventh day, I want you to march around it seven times. And after the seventh lap, I want you to shout with a shout. And when you do, the walls will fall down. And I'm sure Joshua's going, um, maybe we ought to talk about my catapult idea here. And he's wondering to himself, this is really an off-the-wall idea here. But you know how the story unfolded. They did exactly what God told them to do, and the walls came a-tumbling down. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 3 and in verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. You say, but, 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 I think we ought to, well, no, lean not unto thine own understanding. But, but what if we were to, no, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. God knows what he's doing. And sometimes when he tests us, his plans are really unorthodox. Let me just say fourthly, sometimes when God tests us, it seems like we're going backwards. You know, you and I are for efficiency and effectiveness and productiveness and, and, and making a progress. But, you know, God's more interested in making the man than he is the movement and the progress. And sometimes when he's working on us through trials and temptations, it's like we go backwards and, and we say, I'm losing ground here. I'm losing traction here. I'm, I'm taking one step forward, and two step backwards. Lord, what are you doing here? Sometimes it works like that. You know, when God called Gideon to stand up against the Midianite army, the Midianite army was, I, I think, 135,000 soldiers strong. Well, Gideon at least had 22, or 32,000. 
And so he thought, well, I, I, I got a chance. My, my odds are by, like one to four here. But, you know, if we fight good and, and, and maybe God helps us a little bit, you know, maybe we can whoop the Midianites. But God looked at the army of 32,000. He said, it's too many. And so Gideon said, hey, everybody who's afraid, just go ahead and go home. Well, 22,000 men vacated. Now they're down to 10,000. And the odds are getting even worse here, but not for God. God says, you still got too many. If you guys win, you're going to vaunt yourself and say it was our sword and our power that did it. So take these guys down to the brook and let them drink out of the brook. And you remember the test that they had. And, and really, by the time it was over, there were only 300 men, 300 Jewish men against 135 Midianite soldiers. And you would say, man, I, they went backwards. But oftentimes backwards is forwards with God. And when God tests us, sometimes it might involve us going backwards. Sometimes when God tests us, it might feel like he's putting us off. And you might say, well, I'm just not hearing from it at all here. What's the deal? You know, I feel stiff-armed here. I feel like I'm at arm's length here. Look in Mark chapter 7, if you would. Sometimes it feels like God is putting us off. You know, one of my favorite stories in the New Testament around the life of Christ doesn't involve a, a man. It doesn't involve a, a Christian. It doesn't involve a, a Jewish person. It involves a Syrophoenician woman, a, a Gentile woman, a, a heathen woman. And she had an issue. This Canaanite woman had a daughter who was sick. And she wanted the Lord Jesus Christ to heal her daughter. In verse number 24, Mark 7, it says, And from thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon, and entered into a house, and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. For a certain woman, whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, heard of him, and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought or begged him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet or fit to take the children's bread and to cast it unto dogs. You say, what's he saying here? Well, the Jews considered the Gentiles to be dogs. They called them Gentile dogs. And Jesus is saying, you know, I've, I'm here for the Jewish people primarily and I'm here to bring them the bread of life and you know it, it just wouldn't be right for me to take the bread rightly going to them and give it to the dogs well that that would have been an insult in a way and that might have been enough for the average person to just tuck the tail in and go home and give it up but not this woman uh, she was of the sterner stuff than that she had more tenacity than that in verse 28 she answered and said unto him yes Lord Yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. She was going through a testing here. And she sticks her ground. She says, you know, the Jewish people are rejecting that bread. I'll take the crumbs. Yeah, I'm a dog, but I'll take the crumbs. I love what happened in verse 29. And he said unto her, for this saying, go thy way, for the devil is gone out of thy daughter. You know, in another gospel, Jesus said, oh, woman, great is thy faith. I believe it warmed his heart, and I believe he helped her out. It was a trial, and it felt like God was putting her off. And sometimes testings are like that. If you're going to pass the test, you're going to have to be able to maybe be held at arm's length for a while. Because sometimes, folks, God will hold us off until that answer comes. And maybe you're going through that tonight. We see, first of all, the routine of tests. But secondly, let's talk about the reason for tests. The reason for tests. Many years ago, there was a, a candidate who wanted to go to the mission field and wanted to get sent there by a particular pastor and church. And, and there were others who were uh, part of that, that missions board of that church at that time. And so the pastor oversaw this, and he called that missionary to his, his office, and he said, I'll meet with you, but I, I can only meet with you at 3 a.m. tomorrow morning, 3 a.m. in the morning. And so sure enough, the next morning, that candidate got out of a warm bed on a cold night. And he got over to that pastor's office at 3 a.m., but the pastor wasn't there. And the pastor wasn't there at 4 a.m., and he wasn't there at 5 a.m., and he wasn't there at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. Finally, at 8 a.m., he walks in, and he sits down, and he says, all right, let's have the interview now, without apologizing, without saying a word for being late. He said, uh, first thing here, he goes, I, I was wondering if you could spell for me the word baker. And the missionary candidate said, B-A-K-E-R. He said, well, very good. He said, I'm wondering if you could tell me what two plus three is. And the missionary candidate said, uh, five. And the pastor said, well, I think that's it. I, I, I think you'll do. I think I'll, I'll recommend you for being sent as a missionary. And 
The young man got up and he left, shook his hand out before he left, and he, he left smiling. And, and that pastor went back to some other men and deacons in the church, and he said, you know, I, I think we have the right guy here. He said he passed the test in every way. He said, I got him out of a warm bed at 3 in the morning, and, and he came and he showed up. He said, I didn't show up for five hours later, and he didn't say a word about it, didn't even look disgruntled with me. He said he was punctual, he was patient, he uh, held his temper, he showed humility. I asked him to spell baker and add two and three together, and, and he humbly did that, and I did not offend him in any way, and he passed the test. He passed the test. What are the reasons for being tested? In Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 11 and in verse 5, the Bible says, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked in him that loveth violence his soul hateth. You know that it's just the norm for God to try or test the righteous. It's part of his plan to put us through the test. You say, well, why? Well, let me just say, first of all, because he loves you. If you're a child of God, he loves you. And whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, he correcteth, he, he'll test in some way. He wants for us what's best. If you love your children, don't you want what's best for them? Well, God wants what's best for us. Also, secondly, we find a reason for testing is to cause us to think. Sometimes we just get so routine and going through the motions that we really don't stop and look upward and think heavenly thoughts and, and realize what God is up to. Look in John chapter 6, if you would. Sometimes we find those testings or those trials are to cause us to stop and to think. In John chapter 6, we find the Lord Jesus Christ and he's feeding the 5,000. And his disciples are there with him. And uh, they're kind of wondering, how in the world is this going to work? How is this going to happen? In John chapter 6 and in verse number 5, it says, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, was he wringing his hands as he said this? How in the world are we going to afford enough bread for these guys? This is Christ talking. Or do you think perhaps he knew exactly what he was going to do? Of course he did. He knew what he was going to do. He had already thought it through. But he wanted Philip to think. And so we find out in verse number 5, when Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. You know, sometimes the Lord will test us to make us think. Sometimes we get a soft head. And sometimes we get a lazy brain and, and really a, a, an apathetic heart. And, and we really don't stop to think the way we ought to. And maybe the Lord is bringing a testing into your life right now. Somebody sitting here in order to get you to think a little bit. What's God up to here? Now, let me just say thirdly, another reason that God puts us through testing is to cause us to trust him. Or should I say to force us to trust him, to be trust into him. Honestly, sometimes we need it beat into us. Look, if you would, in, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 17. In 1 Kings chapter 17, we find back in the Old Testament a time when there was a famine in the land. There was no rain that had fallen for some time. There were no crops growing. And as a result, things were getting pretty desperate here. And so we find out at the time when Elijah was a prophet of God in the land of Israel, there was this great famine taking place. Well, we find that Elijah shows up to a widow woman in Zarephath, and there's this test that's going to take place there, really, to, to cause this woman to trust God. We pick it up in verse number 8. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, that's Elijah saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman <clears throat> was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now that might have been fine. There might have been a little water there. So there she's off to get that water. But watch verse 11. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, uh, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. Now he's asking a lot. Bread was a precious commodity in the city. In fact, there were people starving in that city. Well, in verse 12, she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, 
but a handful of meal and a barrel and a little oil and a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me therefore a little cake first and bring it unto me and after make for thee and for thy son. That's quite a test because there, there wasn't enough for all three of them. But notice the promise in verse 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Well, how'd she come through? Verse 15. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. You know, God wanted to find out here whether she meant business. And sometimes God with us will see if we mean business and he will force us to trust him. Like he had that wrestling match with Jacob. And finally, he wounds Jacob, Jacob who was a schemer and a supplanter and self-sufficient. And the Lord Jesus Christ wrestling with him that night wounds him. And from that point on, we find Jacob limp limping through life, needing to lean on the Lord. Well, what's another reason for these tests in life? <clears throat> well, let me just say, fourthly, God will allow a test into our life to prepare us for the answer. To prepare us for the answer. You know, we find that Elijah was the spinoff of Elijah. He was his preacher boy, and, and finally Elijah's off the scene now, and Elisha is the new prophet of Israel. And we find out that uh, there was also a, a, a famine at that time, and there was also a, a widow woman at that time who was on the brink of starving and out of, out of money, out of food, and she's the one who borrowed the, the vessels from the neighbor because Elijah said to her in 2 Kings 4.3, go borrow the vessels abroad of thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. Now, why go get the vessels if she only has a teeny little cruise of oil? because God wanted her to prepare for something. And folks, sometimes he will test us with something a little bit off the wall to prepare us for the answer. Sometimes things look hopeless. And you, as I have, have encountered things, if you've been saved any length of time over the years, that looked absolutely hopeless. I've undertaken projects that looked absolutely hopeless, but we've gone forward by faith. You know, we broke ground back in 1990 over at the original site there and we started building another church building when he hadn't even sold the one we were living in or working in at the time. And, and we trusted God that he was going to come through for us. And he did. And even now, we're heading over to Liberia. We're starting a radio station without the frequency yet. But we are trusting God. We are, we are being tested by God, I think, to prepare for the answer that's down the road. Look in 1 Kings chapter 3, just a few pages back. There's another reason for trials and testings, and this one's important, don't miss it. When we are tested, when we are tried, when we encounter a temptation in life, it allows us to use our free will, to exercise our free will. And I've often said that God didn't make us robots, and that's why I don't believe in election and predestination. I believe God has given to us a free will because that's what brings him glory, and that's what brings him honor, when we exercise that in a way that pleases him. He didn't put buttons in our back that he pushes to manipulate us to do whatever he wants. God's never made you do anything, including getting saved. He allowed you to do that, to make that choice. But after salvation, there are times when God will test us in order to let us exercise our free will and see exactly what we're going to do. We find Solomon here in 1 Kings chapter 3. He's the new king, and boy, he's got some huge shoes to fill because David... The man mentioned more in the Bible than anyone else, that illustrious leader and that giant killer in Israel, he's passed off. And now his son Solomon, who hasn't reigned for a day, is suddenly sitting in that throne, in that, that seat with, with, with thousands, hundreds of thousands of people to rule over. And he feels so inadequate, and rightly so. We pick it up in verse number 5 of 1 Kings chapter 3. The Bible says in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said... Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth, and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, 
Thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or to come in. And thy servant is in the midst of a people which thou, canst, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Now here's his request. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked him. You know, God tested him. Solomon could have asked for anything. He could have asked for a lot of money. He didn't. He could have asked for the necks of his enemies. He didn't. He could have asked for long life. He didn't. He asked for wisdom to serve God and bring God glory. He passed the test. God tested him to see what he would decide. And he exercised his free will and made the right choice. You know, we find folks in the Bible, in fact, a, a king who would follow later by the Hezekiah, name of Hezekiah, a king that I really like, that, that God tested, but he did not pass the test. In 2 Chronicles 32, 31, it says, How be it in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. You remember when the sundial stood still and the sun stood still and this great marvel was something that the whole world noticed. And ambassadors came from Babylon to, to inquire of, of what kind of a God could do this. And Hezekiah, unfortunately, in his pride, blows his own horn and shows him all the, the treasures of the kingdom. And he flunks the test. Sometimes God will allow us to use our free will to have, have a test come in our lives. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 8 if you would. There's another reason God allows tests in our life, and that is to keep us humble, to keep us humble. You know, none of us is above pride, and pride can have its tentacles in so many areas that we don't even recognize in our lives. God will allow a testing at times to keep us humble. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, and in verse number 2, we read these words, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Finally, one more reason God allows testing in our lives is that is to see if, if we will compromise or not. Will we end up compromising with this test? Look in Deuteronomy chapter 13. You know, we find these words in verse number one. God says to those same people, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and if the sign or the wonder come to pass, wherever he spake unto thee, saying, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them, thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Notice it mentions a prophet here with a good track record. Things he said have come to pass, and now he's feeling his oats, and he says, let's go worship these false gods. God says, don't listen to them. This is a test, a test. You know, we find that Christians today, I think, are being tested more than ever in these last days, not to succumb to new evangelical ways and apostasy. You know, my pastor used to always say, any old dead log can float downstream. And how true that is. The Bible says we're not going to be crowned, folks, except we strive lawfully. And God may be just testing us in these last days to see if we're going to capitulate and if we're going to compromise or if we're going to keep that flag up without dipping the banner and really finish this thing, press for a mark and finish our course faithfully without dipping that banner. You know, back in 1931, the longest flight to ever take place by a homing pigeon took place. It took place from Vietnam all the way to France, if you can imagine that. 7,200 miles. And this homing pigeon was put in this covered cage and it was placed on a ship in this covered cage and it crossed the South China Sea and it crossed the Indian Ocean and it crossed the Red Sea and it crossed the Mediterranean Sea. 7,200 miles all the way over to France. Took it 24 days. And finally they said, well, let's see if this bird can find its way back to Vietnam. And sure enough, that bird, many, many weeks later, showed up in Vietnam, the very place that it had started from. It stayed the course. 
And the point is this, folks. Let's stay the course. In these days of apostasy, let's fly straight. Let's pass the test. Let's finish faithful. Let's not dip the flag. Let's please the Lord. Well, we've talked about the routine of tests and the reason for tests. And finally and quickly, let's talk the, uh, about the results of our testing. Why the testing? Well, testing is going to bring about greater determination. In Psalm 17, 3, the psalmist says to God, Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and shalt find nothing. I am purpose that my mouth shall not transgress. That sounds like determination, doesn't it? Here's the psalmist going through the testing. He says, I'm not going to buckle. There's a second reason for testing, and that is for our faith to grow. The result of testing is larger faith. Remember Abraham? You say, well, that was quite a test of faith. Well, his test of faith didn't start there. In fact, if you look in Hebrews chapter 11, he had already gone <clears throat> through some tests of faith, and as a result, his faith had grown. You know, the Bible mentions in Romans 12, God dealing to every man the measure of faith. God given to us a measure of faith, and he expects us to use that measure of faith. And when we do, we get more faith. If we don't, we flunk third grade and go back to second grade, or second grade and go back to first grade. God help us to grow in faith and to advance in faith. Now, back to Abraham here. We read this in Hebrews chapter 11. Here was his first test of faith. In verse 8, it says, by faith, and I've underlined that word, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. I've underlined that word. And he went out not knowing whether he went. He left modern-day Iraq, ancient Babylon, or the Chaldees, not knowing where he was going, but it was a test of faith. And he passed that test of faith. You know what happened as a result? Well, look in verse 17. That's where we get to our text. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. You know, God gave him a test of faith, and Abraham didn't waste the opportunity, and he passed the test. These testings give us greater determination, greater faith, thirdly, greater patience, greater patience. Look a page or two forward from where you're at to James chapter 1. In verse number 3, note these words, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. It takes testing, it takes trials, it takes temptations. You and I want faith, and we want patience, but we want it right now, don't we? But this is something that takes time. You know that a bar of steel that's worth five bucks can be melted down and forged into a couple of horseshoes, and now those two horseshoes together are worth ten bucks. You've doubled your money. But that same bar of steel worth five bucks can be heated up and tempered and forged into needles and those needles be worth 350 bucks instead of five bucks. Or that $5 bar of steel can be forged into pen knife blades that are worth $32,000 under the right pressure and heat and hammering. Or that $5 bar of steel, when it's heated up and it's hammered and it's forged and it's manipulated, it's beaten and it's tempered, can be made into springs for watches that are worth $250,000. The point is, the more you heat something up, you temper it, you hammer it, you manipulate it through testing, it's more valuable. And the more we go through the trials and the testings, folks, God gets the most out of us. And let me just say, fourthly, he gets the most glory out of us. Flip a few pages forward to 1 Peter, from where you're at right there. 1 Peter chapter 1. God gets glory out of us when we go through those trials and those temptations. In verse number 7, it says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And folks, that's what it's all about. We have been placed here on planet Earth. God has saved us for one reason. That is to bring him glory. And 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. There's a final result of testing and trials. And if you'll turn back to James again, chapter 1, the final result is blessings. It's, it's rewards, if you will. 
In James 1 and in verse 12, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Do you tend to work, wish away the trials and the testings and the temptations? You shouldn't. There is actually a crown of glory, according to verse 12, a special crown that awaits the child of God who goes through those trials and those testings. They're not easy to go through now. I, I know they are valleys, and I know they are midnights, but, but they are brought into our lives for a good reason. You know, Fanny Crosby wrote that song, Redeemed, who I love to proclaim it. And I like that part that says, He giveth me songs in the night. The songs come in the night. The swing, sweetest singing is often at midnight. And sometimes God teaches his children to sing in the darkness. The story is told back in the uh, 1900s, early 1900s, of these canaries who came from the Hartz Mountains of Germany. They're beautiful canaries, but they were subpar in their singing. They brought a bunch of them over to New York and had an idea that if they, they just gave him bird songs on records and trained them to sing better, they could sing better, these beautiful canaries, but it didn't work. And somebody came up with the idea, and I don't know how he ever thought of it, but he said, you know, what if we were to cover the cages of these birds with a thick cloth and make it totally dark inside the cages and try and teach them to, to sing beautifully through the bird song records? What would happen? Well, it worked. The darkness is what it took for them to sing beautifully. And sometimes God teaches his children to sing in the dark. Maybe you've been in the dark as of late. Maybe you're somewhat in the dark tonight. Why does God put you through tests? Well, we've seen the routine and the reason and the results of it. And I close with this tremendous verse from Job 23:10, where Job, going through the mill, said these words. He said, For he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. God help us to come forth as gold. God help us to pass the test. Let's close here in prayer, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we know that in a group of hundreds like this, there are some folks who are going through some trials. There are folks who are going through some testings. And Father, we pray that you would give to them the grace to go through it, the strength to go through it. Now, Father, we just pray now that you would use these verses and these thoughts, these simple truths tonight to help some of your precious people as they go through the trials. And we'll thank you for it. We pray now and ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.